Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? This is Jeremiah. We are having another webinar in this series. Um, I would kind of call this series of, uh, you know, I read an article uh, a while back, and I can't even remember if it was in it was in Wired, it was in one of these tech articles, but it was interesting, it was just saying how technology companies need to account for the fact that uh, over time, it's no longer, you know, early adopters, and it's it's a different uh, customer base, and, and we have definitely seen that, you know, the, the people buying the software uh, 10 years ago um, were these... Uh, technology early adopters um, very much you know would just figure out things on their own and enjoy doing that and it's a very different um, group of people who, who tend to uh, buy our software now um, with just slightly different expectations you know and, and so things like having everything documented and a video for every imaginable thing and 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 having the software that, that never crashes you know things like that it's just definitely a very different um, expectation level and so it's uh, driven us to um, respond with um, things like this uh, webinar series. So um, we have a great amount of experience to share uh, with getting, you know, these thousands of offices, um, you know, switching to, to a different way of doing things and, and just the, the stories we've heard and the uh, tech support issues we've, we've dealt with. And so we'd love to share some of that knowledge uh, with you because it is definitely... Um, not fun. It's not fun having to change a piece of software that you use every day, uh, quite simply. And so every time it happens, I don't think anyone's like, yay, I'm using a new email client. I don't think people really do. You know, it's just, it's always a pain. So we have a lot to go over. Um, I just want to let you know this is being recorded. So you'll be able to watch it again and again. And we do really want your feedback. Um, and so there's that Q&A button at the bottom. Um, I recommend just clicking that now uh, because not only is that going to make it a little easier for you to type a question real quick if one comes into your head, but notice um, you can see the answers that I'll be typing to anyone else's questions. So it makes a great little companion while you're watching the webinar. So um, I have done enough yimmer yammering. <laughs> I'm going to get this handed over to Crystal to take it away. All right. Thank you, Jer. And good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Jer mentioned, the question about software implementation gets asked a lot to us. Uh, someone will buy a license and now they're kind of stuck with, okay, what do I do next? So um, for the last 10 years, I definitely have learned a lot about how each office operates and kind of the, the ideas that I have behind software implementation. And so as Jer said, my name is Crystal and I am the COO at LandFX. So today we will be covering some unavoidable truths, uh, some common failures that we can learn from. We'll start with where to start on implementation, how to implement, and then really what the keys are to implementation. I do wanna warn everybody before we get uh, too far into this that this uh, software implementation webinar doesn't have a step-by-step -step plan that works for every office. Um, that's kind of why software implementation is so hard, is because it's very specific to each office. Every office is made up of different employees, uh, different priorities, and different uh, atmospheres. And so implementation of software really has to adapt to how it's being managed in the office and the effort put in. So first, uh, I always like to start with kind of addressing some unavoidable situations that you're gonna have during software implementation. And for me, it's best to try to address those early so that when that situation uh, broaches itself, you will be better equipped on how to deal with it. Uh, so managing implementation without full support. This really requires a mentally strong leader because you're never going to have everyone on your team think that this was the best decision. Um, it is really hard to get anyone to agree about things. Like everybody has different personalities, they have different strengths. So when software is implemented, you will always have people who aren't fully on board. So when managing people, when you don't have full support really requires someone who is mentally strong 
because you're juggling a lot. You have different personalities of your team. You have emotional reactions to change, which is really, really strong. Uh, they're also enforcing a new process. So they're enforcing change and then dealing with the pushback. It is very draining. And so you really have to have someone who can handle that and just remind yourself if you're in that situation, it's okay that not everyone's on board. You're never gonna make everybody happy. So uh, some things to keep in mind, if this is your role, communication is gonna be a huge theme that you see throughout this entire webinar. It's pretty much at the core of what managing implementation uh, needs. So you're gonna have to accept and embrace disagreements. That's gonna be a big part of dealing with your team when they don't agree. Also, interacting with your team. Uh, you have to recognize that you are just as much a part of the team. So even though you're leading and you might be the coach, you still have to see yourself as a part of the team and have that empathy and be involved with your team. And then also a big one that I think a lot of people forget, you have to celebrate the achievements. It really helps keep people moving forward and thinking, yeah, we did achieve something. We did move. Uh, we did have progress on this. And those moments will really help keep your team motivated during implementation. A really tough one that uh, is hard to deal with because it's software can feel like magic, but really software is not magic. Uh, I am, when you don't really understand what works behind the scenes of how software gets created or um, the code behind it, it can seem like you can be in kind of awe and wonderment of it because it's doing this thing you never really thought possible. But really software is just a tool and tools help solve the problems, uh, but their success is based on using them effectively. So a lot of times when this whole software is not magic thing approaches, there's all these assumptions. And a lot of times people don't know that they're putting that assumption on it, but it's kind of assumed that if you download the software, it's easy to use right out of the box. It takes no time or effort to really get used to it you should just have this seamless transition. And that's really not true, but <laughs> it always kind of takes a little bit of effort to get used to something new. Um, another assumption is that it should just, when you install it and you save your files, it again has this magical thing of just knowing where to do that for you. But it actually takes additional interaction from you um, because how is software supposed to know exactly what you want without you putting in the time and effort for that? Another assumption uh, is that software should be so easy, I don't have to really learn it, that I would be able to click around, maybe fumble, but I don't need to put any time into adjusting how I might need to use software. Uh, flawless is a <laughs> really difficult one uh, because it's funny how people have a reaction thinking, oh my gosh, the software has a bug and I have an error message and um, why doesn't it have this feature? Well, you look at anything, there's always got to be progression to something. So it software in itself cannot be flawless and people are writing the code. So again, humans make mistakes and it's never going to be flawless. And the customization one, I think year to year becomes a bigger and bigger deal because you can customize fonts and colors and the way things look and background colors. <laughs> and so uh, really the full customization isn't also something that's realistic when it comes to software. Um, it should, it's another assumption, it should run well, it should never crash. When software crashes, we all get that frustration like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And actually, while I was doing my presentation, my software did crash and I lost about an hour's worth of work from my presentation. And so, yeah, it really sucks. But honestly, that falls on me. I should have been saving a lot more uh, frequently. And then lastly, there's always that assumption that software would just solve all your problems. You have this issue there's always an app, there's always something there to quote unquote fix it for you, but it's 
it's there as again a tool because even if I need something to fix my grocery shopping list, I still have to be the one to put in my grocery list. So software is not that end all be all solution for you. Also, I do want to go back because I love Parks and Rec. That's, let's just take a little second to read that because that's uh, one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> And so uh, another situation that will always come up is that software will change. And I know sometimes people like when XP was, when people were trying to transition from that, that was really, really hard for people. There was this thing, you just want to stay in your safety bubble. You know how it works. Yeah, there might be issues, but you feel safe. You know what you're doing with this and something new seems scary. So it's something that you always kind of have to address with software is that yes, you may love the software program that you have now, but there will be adjustments and updates. There's also updates to your industry that will affect how your software operates. And sorry, <clears throat> there's also uh, updates that will affect your current software. So something very similar about how uh, SketchUp came out. 3D then started to become a big part of landscape architecture. And now look at how many different 3D softwares you can use. It's definitely growing and it's constantly going to be adjusting how you operate. Um, and you really can't live in the past. Um, basically, if you still think that you can hand draw for landscape architects, if you still think you can hand draw and keep up with people who are drawing on computers. I give you a lot of props for thinking you can compete against a computer. It's very, very difficult. So yes, there's still an art behind doing hand drawings and being able to have that connection. But again, it will always result that you need to be on a computer. You need to be using software. You know, that, that slide reminds me of something though is, uh, you know, just seeing the drafting tables. Uh, what's interesting is that the drafting table, which is literally in my house now, uh, my dad uh, built. He built when he was in college. And um, so it's, it's, it's actually really interesting that the, the, the basic tool for being an architect um, served him, you know, through 30 years of being a professional. Um, but now, you know, the, the end of his career is, you know, uh, framed by this move to CAD and then CAD moved to Windows and then, you know, all these other changes. And of course, you know, we, we built, of course, in land effects and, um, but the, the rate of change, um, has just, um, been, uh, accelerating and, and certainly you know because it used to be that you know maybe over 30 years there might be some changes to how you would draft and now instead of even being every three or four years um, where you had the time to really contemplate it and to go okay there's going to be that new version of AutoCAD coming out probably sometime next year and and, and you, you have all that time to to deal with those changes now it's literally every year and it, it would only be, imagine how scary it'll be if suddenly it's more than once a year. Um, and so it's absolutely understandable that it's, it's a little scary and a little overwhelming that the rate of change is so fast. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of um, silver linings around that, um, around that change. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go into that more, but just wanted to say that it's, totally understandable and I think as part of particularly is, is the theme of this is recognizing that there's going to be a, a lot of deep psychological uh, frankly resentment to, to change and as a manager that that's really what you need to be aware of that you know when someone says oh this software doesn't work you, you know really what are they really saying and they're really saying well this is change and it's scary and, and that's fine. And just like anything, if, if you have a spouse who's afraid of spiders, you know, you, you deal with that. You find a way around that, you know? So same thing, but okay, I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> no worries. I actually found a huge spider and I'm a little traumatized still from that, so. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so uh, actually going off of what Jay was saying, yes, implementation, it really requires a leader, but that's not necessarily saying a manager. Um, so anyone who is a boss owner manager in that position, really all of this responsibility starts with you. You're setting the tone here for the change. Um, like really, no matter what, change is always hard whether it's in your personal life, work life, software, it's hard. So part of your job is to lead your team and recognize if that role doesn't fit you. And it's totally okay if it doesn't. There are plenty of things uh, that Jeremiah is so much stronger at. So I would rely on him or I would choose someone else on my team to help with the implementation. Um, so yes, you have to choose somebody who is going to be the leader that you need and affect the change that you want. And this doesn't exclude you from the process at all. I know there's going to be two reactions to that. There's going to be one that's like, yes, I don't have to do it. And then there's going to be the other reaction that's like, oh, awesome. I still can be a part of it. So um, it just changes how your role is during implementation. And again, you still have to be very involved with it at some point. So even if you're not the end user of the software, you still need to be involved with what your team is saying. Like I said, change is very, very hard. Um, so why implementation needs a leader is because there's someone who's gonna need to lead the way navigating through all the, the changes um, because ultimately you're gonna have to inspire belief and confidence into the team to change and to embrace something new. And that's very, very hard. So something that you're kind of looking for in a leader when you're in a time of change like this, again, mentally strong, strong communicator, they're interactive with the team, they stay calm in chaos, they're empathetic, and they problem solve. Jared, do we have any questions yet on stuff? Um, well, we just had a couple of uh, comments on, you know, the, the whole, uh, Jeff had a great question on, on the forced upgrades um, and, and the cost and, and, and those two are certainly two very uh, notable elements of, of the change of, of software, of, of, you know, that feeling of being forced to upgrade, uh, the feeling of being forced to spend money, um, let alone uh, to spend money which you, you feel is certainly above and beyond of, of what a reasonable cost would be. And, um, you know, then you, and I would even add on, um, you know, you then have these, these uh, monopolistic powers of, you know, Microsoft and Autodesk. And, and, and that is a whole other element, which is um, unfortunate as well. But again, um, I think the key here, which just like it says is these are all true, you know, understood. Um, but um, these are just elements of the equation. And we can be we can have some empathy for that. And, and we can we can work with it. Um, and you know, maybe if you want to be politically minded, you can always write your congressperson and say, hey, uh, Autodesk needs needs some more regulation because <laughs> they're doing things which I disagree with, for instance, but, uh, but that's a whole other perhaps webinar. <laughs> Um, and that is a very valid point. And I will be honest with people. Sometimes it does suck that you get stuck into subscription base where, yes, you have to upgrade all the time. But uh, trying to put the positive spin on that is that if that's the situation, then um, you are kind of staying ahead of the game and your learning curve is a lot less. So your, the change isn't going to be such a hard reaction uh, you'll maybe have a few things to adapt to, but it wouldn't necessarily be, say, for instance, uh, if someone's upgrading every five years for FXCAD, that's going to be a hard change. Uh, it's going to be a completely different software. And I mean, think about if you upgraded your phone every five years, that's, that's a huge change. You know, like even when you go up to your two-year plan, the cameras are wildly different by then. So um, think of it with that positive spin that, yes, it's unfortunate. Sometimes companies put you into that situation, um, but there is a positive to it. So uh, now that we've identified some of those inevitable situations, I also like to address a lot of the common failures that I see. Uh, and this is where it can get a little 
dicey with the emotional side because it might push some buttons. So please just be aware of that. Um, so a common failure, one of the kind of most initial first ones I see is failure to properly research and test software. So I did a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago about considerations and costs and software decisions. And I go over a lot of where people fail when it comes to finding the right software because you can't implement if you don't have the right software. Um, I really love John Wooden. If anyone's a basketball fan, you should know how amazing he is. But I love his quote here with, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you ever have time to do it over? I think it's a really good point to this. Uh, a lot of where the failure to properly research comes from is laziness. We just want to have a tool again, really quick. We want to look at the website. That should be our yes and no, but it really doesn't, it's really not that simple. So please take a look at that webinar. So there's uh, a lot of times, again, I know I've touched on this before, this expectation that software will and should solve the problem. <laughs> and I once had an IT person kind of explain it to me as why isn't this toilet wiping? <laughs> and it's, again, software is a tool. It's doing a lot of that hard work for you, but you still have to interact with that software. Uh, because a lot of times when someone feels that software has failed them, we fixate on that one thing that it couldn't do versus all the things it can do. You know, we've really changed our experience with software from, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. And just again, recognizing that it's a tool to, oh my gosh, I can't believe it doesn't do this. I, I just, I can't use the software if it doesn't do this one feature. But you're getting kind of stuck into this box of, okay, so the toilet's not wiping for you. So you're just not gonna use a toilet. <laughs> so my solution for this is you have to keep in mind that you are the one that actually solves your own problems. Be motivated by that. And that software is a tool to help you achieve that. A really big failure is the lack of follow-up on the team's usage. Um, so remember, your team is trying to affect a change that you want. And a lot of times, they don't want to do that, going back to the not having full 100% support. You're asking them to do another thing, and it's a new way. So it's, there's all this kind of negativity to it. They might go into the software, click around, doesn't do something. That's where it ends for them. Uh, so you have to be the one, the manager, the leader, to really research what's going on when someone tells you it didn't work. Because what didn't work? Did you try looking up? Did you try contacting the software company? Um, what kind of effort was put behind whatever function isn't working? because also there could be workarounds. Again, I'm a really big fan of asking questions. If it didn't work, did you contact the software company? Is it something that they're working on? Is it something that could be implemented? But again, it kind of goes back to the whole, it should solve the problem. Oh my gosh, you can't do this one thing. So I'm just not gonna use the software. Again, that leader and manager is there because you need someone there to encourage that change to be involved with what's going on. And I know that Jeremiah kind of touched on this before. So Jared, did you have any quick comments that you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I think, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the way I often will word it is, you know, like, uh, for instance, you know, we, we've literally had people come up to us at a trade show and, and say, uh, does your software do X yet? you know and we'll say oh no that's you know, something we're working on you know that'll be in the future they go oh well then i can't buy it and and, and i'll and I, I just find myself going well wait a minute okay if it does 95 other things but it doesn't do this one thing isn't that still a net positive you know and and, and it's just basically very simple math at that point um that if if something helps you out with most things, but maybe one or two things you still have to do the same way, if anything, 
you should see that as a good thing because that means it's not a total change for every aspect of your business. A couple things might still be the same way you're used to, which will ease the transition, I would like to think. Um, and uh, another one related, though, that, that I find myself having to remind people, and, and it's unfortunate that, that I have to say it, um, but you know, if you come walking up to me at a trade show and say, well, your software doesn't blah, 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 I can't buy it and then walk away, you know, wh where's my incentive? Am I going to rush out and develop that feature just for you? As opposed to if you buy the software because of all the things that it does do, you're now a member of that software community. Now you say through the ch support channels or whatever, um, hey, I love this software. There's this one feature I was really hoping you could develop. That's a very different conversation. Now you're inside the building, so to speak. You're, you're a member of that software community. You can post on the forum and, and all these things. And, and so it's a matter of you know, which do you want? Do you want to be that person yelling from the street? You know, I could never buy your, your cookies, you know, or do you want to be a, a customer and have that more privileged communication with the business owner and, and have basically a more intelligent, more professional conversation about it. Okay. And uh, again, communication is a big failure. Um, we'll go over more communication, so I won't try to belabor this too much, but um, obviously this skill is probably the most important you can ever develop and especially trying to remember that why communication is so big is because this is uh, a change. And so for this common failure, it's I kind of roped in communication and ineffective meetings. Um, so for, for the communication aspect, you have to really remember that every single day this is a struggle. And so this is a part of why the whole managing implementation takes is always going to never end. You have moods and personalities that will affect everyone's day to day, body language, all of those emails, texts, all those technological messages we have every day. Um, plus, no one likes meetings. So when you're communicating and when you're trying to affect this change, you have to realize that there, there is no simple solution here. It's just something that, again, you're going to have to take that effort every single day to acknowledge how your team is feeling, seeing the different personalities, um, trying to be positive. And with meetings, I've never had an employee cheer for a meeting like, yay, we have a meeting today. Um, no one likes them. So I read, I've been reading a lot about just when you have a meeting, it needs to be to the point, lose the fluff, um, but we'll actually cover a little bit more of that later. So the most common failure I do come across is if someone is saying it has to be done this way because it's our way. Um, really, you're just kind of throwing a temper tantrum at this point because there's no way that you're going through life this way. And it's actually something I find more, there's a kind of an underlying issue where really what the problem is, is that they can't get over one feature of the software that it doesn't have, or because there's just really a fear of change and lack of knowledge. Um, when any, any time you're going into something new and you're just, you're not as knowledgeable and it's very intimidating and it can be very scary um, to put yourself out in that situation. So I really find that if someone is saying this, it's one of those two kind of situations that are happening. And so, again, you can't be confined to a set way. That's not how you're living your life because it's only going to inhibit you. And you're, again, life is about adapting. So nothing stays the same. This, this statement is more about trying to find why something is holding you back. Because the only way that you're going to be able to move forward is to really address why am I so scared to change and have something be done a different way? Um, because a different way could, or an improved way could become the new your way. So um, really this is one of those things where you kind of have to check in with yourself and realize you're the one holding back some, 
some issues in dealing with that. Another really common one I see is implementation is waiting for the right time. But when has there ever been the right time to do something? Look at this pandemic. You know, we all probably had plans this year. We were waiting for the right time to do something. And we have some outside thing come in and it completely <laughs> ruins our year. So uh, waiting for the right time is kind of a delusion. And just again, recognizing it and checking in with yourself that this is an unrealistic expectation. And you have to, all you can do is come prepared as much as possible and jump in. And that's where that is the hardest is to just put in the effort to close your eyes and say, okay, we're going forward with this and whatever situations come up, that's going to come up, but we're going to be able to deal with that. And so again, just communicating to your team that, yeah, there's going to be some bumps in the road, but if that happens, if that happens, we're just going to regroup and find a solution to it. Uh, so another one I'd like to go over is an implementation that's done with part of the team and not everyone. Uh, this is such a big issue uh, because a lot of times, and I've done, I've made this mistake actually with our project management software. So I do feel very connected to how much of an epic failure I had with this before. Uh, so a lot of times someone will say, oh, I just want to buy one license. I have 10 people and this one person is going to set up everything. They're going to get the standards set up, a customization, all the policies and procedures. And really that's, again, very unrealistic. You're not saving money and you're not saving time with this. And you really, it comes down to your team. You can't expect your team to get on board with using something if only a few people are using it at first and they're left out. Um, it really causes confusion issues and it does show that your team, or it does show to your team that you're kind of undermining your own decision. So I did this with our project management uh, software, FreedCamp, and it was a huge mistake because I just wasn't sure and so I wanted to test it out with a few people and I quickly saw that as I needed to test a few things I needed to add oh I need to add this person oh wait I need to add this person and so it left me with a lot of situations on trying to deal with some employees who felt left out of the loop uh, why are they not included but also having repeated conversations training sessions um, and then a lot, of, a lot of those misunderstandings with procedures because I'm talking to this person about a different procedure and this one has a different procedure. So it ended up wasting a lot of our time and start to free camp, but uh, actually we got all on board and got it together. So uh, the biggest learning lesson I can put for this is keep your team together through this experience because it only really will help encourage your team, uh, build unity and really support your decision. Well, and also you didn't even mention there, you know, there was a whole period of time where there was just total confusion on where do I put the notes for this project? And, you know, some people were using the old system and some people were using the new one. And, and, and that was, you know, from my perspective too, that was like a huge source of confusion and, and just literally chaos because someone would go, well, I made notes about it. And you'd have to now ask, which system were you using? Um, as opposed to, yeah, if we had just kind of embraced it as more of an office-wide change. Yeah, it's a very unfortunate learning lesson, but I do feel that if anyone would like to talk to me about that, I am happy to walk you through that. <laughs> and then kind of going off of what Jer said with uh, the two different systems, uh, a big failure to address is not setting a cutoff date. Um, you, a lot of times I see companies just kind of use that as a crutch that, oh my gosh, if this one system fails, we always have this one. But again, your team is not always going to be 100%. So if you have someone comfortable with the old system, they're gonna probably keep using that up until you pry it out of their cold dead hands. <laughs> so set a cutoff date and you have to uh, communicate that to your team, put in a calendar that's shared with everyone so everybody sees that it's coming up. You're gonna have to remind your team over and over and the biggest thing is stick to the date. Uh, and I really, try to 
not undermine how difficult implementing new software is, but I think when it comes to implementation, more of the built up of how difficult it is, is really just addressing your fear and your reaction to change. And the bigger part of implementation is managing the person personalities of your team. So let's get into actually implementation, where to start. Start please with my previous webinar. <laughs> And uh, that will take you through all the steps of how to research, how to do a comparison to all the different softwares. Uh, and it really kind of addresses all the needs, wants, functionality, training services, all these really important information that will actually help translate to creating a plan for your implementation. So by properly doing uh, the research and trialing of software, you are going to find the right tool which is exactly what you need. Um, and it's going to lay a lot of the foundation and do a majority of your work for creating a plan. Another place I'd like to start with is stop thinking about money. Once you've purchased the software, you can't keep like fretting and stressing, oh my gosh, it costs this. How quickly are they implementing? What's my ROI? What are the transition and training costs? How much time are we spending on these changes? You have to stop that at that point. You've spent the money. If you've properly done your testing and researching, this is the right tool. Yes, no matter what software you're going to use, you're going to run into things, but you can't allow the money part to drive your focus. And I don't know about you guys, I hate corny acronyms and these like complex processes that really are simple, but you're just trying to use all these buzzwords. To me, I just find it very revolting and I don't, I've never met anybody who is like, oh yeah, I problem solve with my acronym, whatever it is. <laughs> so um, how to implement is actually pretty easy. You have to create a plan. So you've already did most of that work uh, when on the previous slide by doing all that research and trialing ahead of time. Uh, now at this point, your plan is just prioritizing and putting that information together. Uh, you're gonna create short to the point lessons and create space in those lessons for questions and discussions. Uh, that's a big part of you know, the plan is being able to interact with your team, have them talk to you, make sure that they're being interactive with those lessons. Scheduling effective meetings. So again, I've never met anyone who's, who's so excited to have a meeting. A lot of times people are just uh, worried about what was left on their desk. So when you schedule these effective meetings, implementation for the first four weeks you need to meet once a week and what you're doing from creating your plan you're going to use those to the point lessons as the agenda for those meetings put it in that shared calendar even what the lessons are going to be so people know what's going to happen in meetings for implementation lose the fluff and pep talks you can save that for your individual conversations with your team but Nobody cares. I hate to be honest. Nobody cares. Uh, so just just lose it so people hear exactly that's, what you want. That's what I do at meetings. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, also keep meetings short and digestible. If you give too much information, no one's going to retain it. So you want to try to keep the meetings specific and to the point. And then after the first month, it's important that you evaluate your meeting needs but you're not getting rid of the meetings completely. You can ask any employee here. We still meet almost all the time about Freed Camp. There's constant conversations about it. So you just have to readjust how your team needs to meet to continue implementation. And then again, part of this plan, set a cutoff date, communicate, stick to the date, and you're done. Really with implementation and how to implement when everybody's trying to find this secret recipe on perfect implementation, I hate to say it, there is none. The biggest part and why people are trying to find this solution is because you just have to do it. That's the hardest part. You have to jump in, 
you have to use the software, you actually have to work through these experiences in order to implement software. Again, for the landscape architects out there, you're forced to with CAD. So you kind of feel like you don't have any room to complain or adjust, but every single year you're doing that with CAD. You're, oh, we've got another update and it's a new file version and we have this and now it has a different background. You're getting used to that, and, but you have to work through that in order to get used to that. So implementing really comes down to action. So let's move on to what I think the keys to implementation are and had to put in some Harry Potter there. Uh, the role of leadership. So this is a very, very important aspect to it because it's the tone that you're setting and it's how your team is going to respond. It takes constant, constant effort to manage, to enforce and to encourage implementation. Uh, you're managing multiple personalities and emotions, and you're managing all the reactions to resistance to change. It really takes someone to be able to, it does, it's like a full-time job because it has a lot of different play into your team. And so it is a lot of talking and it's a lot of discussing. Um, so yes, leadership, again, it's a common theme you'll see throughout here. And you know, and uh, uh... Jeff had another great comment, which is true, which is in a lot of uh, uh, companies, that leadership role is someone who's not, you know, in the trenches, so to speak, you know, very common up somewhere like, well, I don't even know CAD, I've never used CAD. And I think that's definitely, you know, also an important part of leadership is um, knowing, you know, when to step aside, uh, knowing when to uh, um, assign someone with the, the, the role of being the leader with the actual technical knowledge. It's important that the leader has the technical knowledge. You know, you're not going to be able to do it without the ability to actually get in there and use the software. Yeah, that definitely hits on that point where I had that message to the, to the bosses, managers, owners out there, because there are so many things that, you know, we have software wise in our own office where I honestly, I am not that techie of a person. So I'll just throw up my hands and say, you know what, Bennett, you got it. I trust you. I'm going to interact with him. I'm still going to make sure things are working. But if I don't use it and understand it, I'm going to put someone who does use it and understand it to help the rest of the team uh, actually get that implemented. So it is definitely on, and this is the role of leadership, not just leadership in the sense of the person leading through the implementation, but it's a leader and the owner of the company. The way that you react to all of this is, the, is that tone that you're setting to how your team is going to respond. So you get that CAD version, and if I'm going, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, this is a piece of crap, that's how your team is going to react to it. But if you have someone who is like, hey guys, this is going to be really hard, but we'll work through it. If you have an issue, come to me and we'll find a solution that is that better way that your team is going to respond to the change. Um, so going back to the slide, um, enforcing. So that's a really hard word because it is a very strong force kind of thing. If you force anybody to do something, they're not going to want to do it. Uh, and this is why it's a key to have a good leader, not necessarily a manager, when trying to do implementation. Because you have to strike that balance between being stern and being flexible. Um, it's also a constant process and it never actually ends. Implementation is a continuing, continuing effort and you have to stay on top of it because why it still continues, sorry, is adapting as these updates and changes are released. So again, if uh, CAD or FreedCamp releases a new update, I, as the person who's leading this implementation, I need to be on top of that and address how that is going to change our procedures. And again, encouragement. It does go a long way with motivating your team. Uh, communication will always be a part of this. So whether it's how you're communicating, um, if it's just a, about the communication of all the things that you guys have been achieving, all of that stuff to keep your team encouraged and motivated to go through change is a huge, huge aspect. 
Um, also encouraging your team with additional time and support for people who are going to have a hard time with change. Again, it's inevitable about that. So you need someone who can be there as a supporter as well. So I'm not going to try to belabor communication too much. Um, I know Jer kind of sighs at my communication slide here, but a big one that a lot of people don't really talk about with communication, which I do want to talk about, is listening. Um, you do, as a leader, again, helping your team through a change that has an emotional reaction, you need to be able to listen and listen as in the sense of be in the conversation and listen to what they're saying and stop trying to think about the response you want to have while they're talking. Um, also, be active in that listening. Look at the speaker, nod along, and a big one, restate what you've heard. So a big one that I think is very uh, not talked about a lot is embracing disagreements. A disagreement that your employee is bringing to you does not actually equal conflict. This is actually something I struggle with a lot because I feel uh, the need to please everybody. So it's really hard for me to hear disagreements, but it really, that person is bringing it to you not to try to make an issue. Uh, so really view that as an opportunity to discuss and learn. Uh, the disagreements are really great for also bringing different perspectives that can broaden the horizon. I really think that that quote uh, from George Patton there is something that we kind of forget is that if everyone is thinking alike, then someone isn't thinking, you know, we've come so far in our society because we've had people with different perspectives and experiences and your employees have those different perspectives and experiences and they're just as valid as yours. And really handling disagreements with respect. It takes a lot of courage for someone to come up, especially if you're in a leadership or boss role. If someone is coming to you with, with that sort of courage to say, hey, I don't think that this is right, really kind of respect that that was really hard for them. So be open-minded, allow yourself to hear what they have to say and accept that different idea. And I will always, always, always Asking questions is my biggest thing to try to encourage for people, whether it's during the trial process, asking questions to the software company that you're using, or just asking questions in general for meetings um, or in conversations to avoid further misunderstandings. So if you ever had someone say something where you're just like, what are they trying to say? Like, what did you mean by that? Literally ask that question. It's okay to to get clarification for yourself. There's no issue to that. But also with asking questions in a listening format, keep your questions on topic. So if someone came to you with an issue about a project, don't then derail the conversation to, oh, but did you ever get this and this done? That's really kind of disrespectful to that speaker. So when you're asking questions, make sure it's on topic. For the speaking side, I think we all kind of know these. So be clear and direct, lose the fluff. Don't hesitate to start the conversation, uh, especially again, if you're the leader, it starts with you, you're the one. If you feel a situation requires a, a discussion, you're the one that needs to start it. It's not up to your employee or your team member. So uh, don't hesitate, get those conversations started and then using your meetings effectively. Have a clear objective. And then uh, I actually read somewhere where there's 300,000 hours wasted on status meetings. So steer clear of status meetings. And again, John Wooden for the win, whatever you do in life, surround yourself with smart people who will argue with you. Jer, anything on communication that people have questions on? Um, no, just uh, uh, did get a mention that it was all very good information. So I think that's, uh, that's awesome. I think it's very good. Communication is key. Yes, it is. So uh, another part of what I think is a key to helping implementation is realizing implementation isn't a one size fits all. What we do for our office is not necessarily what's going to work for every other office. And this is in a lot of my conversations and what I've learned with people 
this is the biggest thing is understanding your team is different. Everyone calls me to say, hey, how do I implement? Where do I start? I don't know. I, I have to talk to you about your team. How many people do you have? What other software are you using? What are your guys' priorities? Are you using uh, SketchUp? Are you using Lumion? There's so much to it, but you have to understand your team in order to implement because each team is built different. So understanding your team dynamics, strategize ahead of time. This is part of that kind of creating plan. Strategize how people can help you um, because if you have more team support, if you're allow allowing your team to help during that, you're going to have a bigger effect with them. There's going to be, again, you might not have 100%, but you might get 90, 99%. Um, and encourage your team to recognize strengths in others. I think this is a big one when it comes to asking questions and where people feel comfortable. If there is someone in the office that is really good with fixing computers or uh, Photoshop, if I need something, I'm going to ask my team, hey, you're really good at this. Can you help me with this? Can you either train me on it? Can you do this part of the project? It, it again is building your team up uh, and it's a really good team builder. Recognizing uh, ahead of time who, who's gonna have issues and trouble adapting, it's really important that you understand who those people are on your team so that you can better help them and support them during this time of change. Whether they need a one-on-one -on -one training session, if you maybe just offer help more, more help and support for them or time, um, being able to identify those people because no one's gonna come up and say, hey, hey boss, I, I can't do this, this is really hard. No one's going to offer that. That's, again, embarrassing for them. So uh, you're going to need to be there to help support them. And then a big one that I'd like to add in here for this is because it's a more positive spin, is using a new software might actually uh, create some potential with employees that you didn't know. So there's a lot of people in our office I didn't know was great with Photoshop or I didn't know that they were uh, so skilled at photography. And that will only help with um, fostering that evolution for that, for that particular employee, but it also helps encourage employees who maybe are strong within CAD to build their uh, skill level, to advance and push them to be better. My band, John, the main ingredient to stardom is the rest of the team. So one that I think a lot of team or a lot of offices don't necessarily think of or use is documentation. Uh, as you can tell, if you're a land effects client, we love our documentation. It's documentation every single day. So uh, it really helps with training. It's going to keep your uniform training. Um, it's going to reduce time and cost when you add new employees and a good source of it will help answer repetitive questions so you're not banging your head against the wall with the same questions. Also documentation will help enforce your standards. It'll reduce the chance of mistakes and really help maintain the consistency that you want for your standards. And a big aspect, learning and growing because again software is going to change so you'll be able to identify if inefficiencies, solve uh, problems more quickly because you'll be able to kind of pinpoint where that is in the process. I'd also, you know, I'd also add, you know, because like I said, it's going to happen again. <laughs> you know, you're going to change software again. And by having it documented, you know, instead of just going, oh, was it? Yeah, this was the problem we had last time, wasn't it? And, you know, you don't want to sit there and rely on people's memories, you know. So have things documented with uh, the challenges and, and the learning lessons so that because, you know, you, you will. You will be changing software again and you want to learn from those mistakes. And uh, adapting to, just like Jer said, adapting to new software is, again, inevitable. Uh, you're actually already doing it all the time now, but you're just not really realizing it because it might just be a small change here and there. But really, again, it's always difficult because it's just something new. And that will go away because once you get more familiar with it, it's not new anymore. And so... Uh, 
I like I was going to have a whole thing on tractors, but I decided not to, you know, tractors are helpful. So I, Jared and I always laugh about this. If you're tilling a field with a horse and someone rides up on a tractor to say, Hey, I could do this for you. They're not going to be like, Oh no, no, no. I, I don't need your tractor. I'm going to take the rest of the week to till this uh, land when you can use your magical tractor in just a day just because I don't want to learn how to use a tractor. That's ridiculous. So <laughs> yes, you're going to have to find it within yourself to adapt to change uh, because failure is not fatal, but failure to change might be. Thanks, John. So I would like to say thanks everybody for attending. I'm always happy to help answer any questions, um, especially if you are trying to implement software right now and you just need some direction, I'm happy to help. Um, that's my email. Our phone number is all over our website. And Jer, do we have any questions? Well, um, I think uh, Ian was able to um, bring up um, all of them that we had. So I don't know if anyone has any more questions here. We got a couple minutes. You're welcome to hammer some in. And you know, I would just, um, I'll, I'll make a, a, another quick comment on you know the perspective of um of uh, you know it's it's a little hard to to word because um but empathy with the software company and because i know that um you know like we said you know you've got these monopolistic powers i mean there's a recent on if you were aware there was a recent open letter signed by all pretty much all the major architecture firms of the world uh criticizing autodesk for uh revit um, and, and, you know, that's kind of what is necessary to get them to change. But um, that is a viable step. Get an open letter, get every architecture firm to join you in signing that open letter and force them to, to uh, change. Um, but, you know, from a software company that's not so much a monopolistic power, uh, you know, they do have their revenue stream they're always having to worry about. And so the, the only thing I'd mention is that is some people, you know, will say, oh, the software seems expensive or, oh, I have to pay for it every year. And, you know, just understand from the company of running a software company, you know, you don't want to say, oh, this person bought our software and we'll never see them again for the rest of eternity um, because, you know, they don't believe in paying for updates or we're not going to provide updates or something like that. You know, they're running a business as well and, and they have their, uh, you know, revenue in and they have their product that they're producing. Um, and so, you know, obviously there is a concept of money, but I'm just saying particularly we do get a lot of people um, almost want to say not so much arguing, but, you know, very vehemently mentioning, you know, their personal philosophy on whether renewals should be necessary or not. And, and just reminding them that, you know, these software companies are also in this, you know, as a business, um, they're there to keep providing this product and they do need their revenue stream too. And so it isn't, it isn't as easy as, every software company is evil and only money grubbing basically you know <laughs> um they are you know even the big the big ones like autodesk they're going to be moved by this critique from all these architecture firms and and we'll see maybe maybe revit will dramatically improve in the next few years and, and that'll be exciting so there is this interaction that you can have with the software companies um hopefully not adversarial at times um you know like i said being a member of their community through their their support channels and such um, but I just wanted to make that comment too that you know the sympathy is in terms of your own people who might be afraid of change as well as with the software companies themselves communication helps with them too. go feel free to let them know how you feel but understand they are running a business as well and their income is the cost of software so there is that hopefully a little bit of a give and take is what i was going to say and see there i go again you got me rambling <laughs> but, um, um well i guess we got everyone's questions so i think we will just call it a day and wish everyone a very safe and fun weekend.